until the Second World War changed his life. Bored in the desert, Arthur tried his hand at theatre and was immediately bitten by the bug. Back on Civvy Street, he headed straight for the Frank Fortescue players in Manchester, where he met his future wife, actress Joan Cooper. He was having a reading on the stage and she said, Who is that voice? It's got the most wonderful speaking voice. I must go down and see, and it was Arthur. She said, and I knew he'd be a star, Pam. Management, I don't think, quite caught on to this, and they were, they were right about it. And I, <laughs> they were incredibly, now to think about it, they were going to sack him. And she said to, them, to the producer, no, no, you're completely wrong here. This is the best actor we've got in the company. And so he was saved and um, went on. I think she was almost his Fingali in that sense, you know, she encouraged him enormously. Arthur and Joan were married in a London registry office in January 1948, where two passers-by acted as witnesses. They celebrated at Lyons Corner House with Welsh Rabbit. She was the leading lady in Fortescue's. Oh yes, my dear, and she said, and of course she said, I was earning more than Arthur, you know. So I was earning, I think it was six pounds a week, and Arthur was only getting three. <laughs> he loved to tell that. But Joan's career was put on hold when their son, Stephen, was born. Arthur, however, was getting regular work. From the very beginning, he kept a meticulous record of every single role he played. His bank manager appearance and natural acting style made him perfect for character parts. I represent the magazine Titbits, by whom I'm commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. A memoir? Joan kept a watchful eye on everything concerning Arthur, and he was very influenced by what she had to say. I mean, for instance, she always read every script that came into the house. I remember him at home when I was young as either having a script in his hand, learning his lines, or having the telephone in his hand ringing up for, for more work and his quite an aggressive search for work. He played, I think, practically every theatre in Britain and he was very proud of that. Uh, he used to talk about, you know, the old inner London circuit and the outer London circuit. There used to be all these theatres everywhere. Arthur's first big break came in 1960 when he landed the part of Leonard Swindley in Coronation Street. From this moment on we are strictly a cash house. Strictly cash. Would you mind removing the notices from the window? No money refunded, no goods exchanged. He was a pompous, pedantic, fusspot, uh, a perfectionist, and that was Arthur. In the end, he always delivered a superb performance, but he was, I have to say, quite difficult. He was very, very fussy and very, very prickly, uh, or could be very prickly, and very, very critical of everything. Uh, and sometimes you thought, what a pain in the ass this is. It wasn't the happiest time for Arthur because initially Joan stayed in London and Arthur used to travel on the train up to Manchester, spend the week there and then um, just come home at weekends. They're up my judogi. Arthur's success as Leonard Swindley led to the spin-off series, Pardon the Expression, Granada's new hit comedy. Like a fugitive from the Mikado. Arthur now topped the bill. Yes, it does give one rather an orient flair, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the flowers that bloom in the spring troll are have nothing to do with the pigs. <laughs> when you're doing comedy, you cannot fail. It's like mathematics. You can't be quarter right or half right or 70 percent right. You've got to be absolutely right, otherwise you die. And Arthur knew this, and all this kind of fussy emphasis that he put into his work was to get that effect, because his effects were so exact. His timing was marvellous, his every inflection is superb. And you look over and he'd just be doing something, something tiny with a teacup or his collar or something, that he'd found something to, to use to get comedy out of. I mean, he was brilliant like that. My ad was for a car. I was selling a car and I put my address and they must have put the address on the wrong ad. <laughs> Is there something... Uh... <laughs> he just had this comic edge, Arthur, when he delivered a line. He would give you a look which would actually enhance that line and make it even funnier. <laughs> I think it's pretty likely, it's pretty likely. <laughs> I mustn't 
waste the ice. <laughs> In those early days, he, he, they terrified him. Audiences terrified him. He used to literally groan when he came out on the set. And, oh dear, <laughs> you know, got to make these people laugh. He didn't like the mass of people. He was a very retiring, uh, very, very uh, slightly isolated man. I mean, he wasn't. Uh, he, <laughs> he was the antithesis of a lovey. <laughs> Who do you think the success of Pardon the Expression brought Arthur to the attention of writer Jimmy Perry. And in 1968, Arthur was cast as Captain Mannering in Dad's Army. Written by Jimmy Perry and David Croft, the new series would fully exploit Arthur's natural talent to play the pompous little Englishman. Now the first thing to do is to appoint a properly appointed commander. A what, sir? Appoint a properly appointed commander. That's me. <laughs> All right? There was a, never a part that suited an actor more than Captain Manry. After we'd been working together for about two to three years, Arthur Lowe became Captain Manry, and Captain Manry became Arthur Lowe, and we just wrote for him. Now, as chairman... Uh... <laughs> Why ever is it, whenever we have a meeting about anything, you're always the chairman? Who elected you? That's what I want to know. I was elected by the steering committee. Oh. And who elected the steering committee? I did. <laughs> yeah, I know that you have more ample proportions than Mrs. Fox. <laughs> but you're not Lady Godiva, are you? <laughs> hello, hello, hello? Hello? <laughs> That's it, Wilson. River patrols. Half a dozen determined men, half to the teeth with a boat. They could, they could play havoc with the Nazis if they got a foothold. What? A natural talent the man had. It was extraordinary, really. I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, you, you can try and do things. Some people try and do them and they can't. They've seen something, they've seen someone do it and they, they try and do it. It, it doesn't, doesn't work out. You've got to have that. You had to get up and go to work each morning and you couldn't call yourself an actor unless you had that job to go to and bring the bread in. I will observe that I keep one foot on the ladder here and one hand on the post here. The other foot is in the boat thus. <laughs> Arthur was fascinated by the sea all his life. He said that he would have liked to be a seaman, uh, but his eyesight uh, precluded uh, passing the, the, the eyesight test. <laughs> Arthur's infatuation with the sea led to family holidays as passengers on cargo boats. He filmed their trips as they coasted around the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. And his terribly romantic views of life generally he would buy flowers all the time and he uh, would choose romantic uh, places to spend weekends. And he was always, what does Joan want? Always. It was a big love affair, without a doubt. Always on, um, like Valentine's days, he used to, and birthdays, he, he used to choose very carefully little tokens of love and affection. Arthur's romantic dream was to have his own boat, and in 1968, he bought a derelict 19th century steamboat, which he lovingly restored. He called it the Amazon. Joan learned to navigate. Oh yes, Joan learned navigation so she could navigate. They had a crew. He loved being master of his ship and loved entertaining and he used to serve a drink called the Amazon cocktail which was either gin or vodka with um, dry ginger and lots of ice and a slice of cucumber. We had many adventures and our, probably our best times as a family were the times we spent on board the boat. But Joan hankered after her life on the stage. She felt that she'd made a big sacrifice, giving up her own career. And then when Stephen was of an age, she wanted very much to be back in on the boards doing it. Arthur was now a household name in television but he still performed regularly in the theatre. I think it refueled his batteries, really. He was very proud of his uh, more prestigious theatre work. 
he was very genuinely honoured to play alongside Gilgood and Olivier. Reviving the spirit of their early days on stage together, Arthur and Joan began touring once again. Good morning, Mr. Manum. He also managed to find small parts for her in television. Please, two cups of coffee and some rich tea biscuits. The ration's been cut again. I'm afraid I can only let you have one and a half biscuits each. We do our best to keep up morale. Yes, but working brilliant. together would soon put Arthur in a difficult position. There was an occasion when he said, um, Peter, please, if it's anything to do with theatre work, if Joan can't be included, then don't even tell me about it.